Good evening, good evening. Um, I'll just leave it a few more seconds while my computer catches up. Um, we are live. I am live with uh, Arthur Aidan Martin. Um, as usual, uh, this podcast is sponsored by No Mean City Clothing uh, and Armour Scaffolding uh, for all your scaffolding needs. Um, hi, Aidan. Thanks for coming on. Um, it's great to uh, great to finally speak to you. Um, yeah, let's go, let's go back to the start uh, of, of of everything really, and and you know just tell me about you. Yeah, so I was born in 1986 in Livingston, and for anyone who's not familiar with that area, it's between Glasgow and Edinburgh, and it's Newtown. You would overspill of predominantly Glasgow, but Edinburgh as well. When I was born there, it was at a time when it was still in very early development, so there wasn't there wasn't a lot in Livingston, you know. It was, you know, working class, a lot of working class values, a lot of good people, families, but a lot of people that didn't have very much either. Um, in my very early childhood, you know, my biological father wasn't, he was already gone from my life, basically. And as I got older, I learned that he was heavily involved in a, an addiction lifestyle. So, you know, he worked in the oil rigs and would be involved with a lot of violence, a lot of substance abuse, in and out of prison, all that kind of stuff. By the time I was three, four, five years old, my mum was looking after me and my older brother, and she was working three jobs to take care of the two of us. So she worked two jobs in pubs and one as a cleaner. Um, so like a lot of families, you know, a lot of single parents, she relied heavily on her own parents, grandparents who lived around the corner. So we grew up in an area called Ladywell within Livingston and my grandparents were around the corner. My grand and granddad, no, my granddad was a taxi driver. My granny worked in biscuit factories and they would feed us. And my auntie, who was an air hostess, was send clothes for us. So it was a very, very modest beginning. My mum met a man in the pub who became my stepdad, um, who I grew to call dad. But, you know, for the most part, it was a very different world back then. You know, there was no social media. You you played outside with your pals. You played football. You built gang hearts. You went to the gala days. You know, community was very important. People, they knew each other on first name terms, or at least, you know, they knew each other on surname terms. But people knew each other back then. There was a lot of <clears throat> community. But the older I got, the more violent it got, you know. It, like I say, it was a working class area which had pros and cons, and the cons were there were a lot of people that came from a lot of traumatic backgrounds. There were people who were in lifestyles that were, were socially deprived. Um, and by the time I got to high school, that, that high school at that time um, was bottom of the league tables, I think, and definitely in West Lothian, but possibly even for the whole of the country for stuff such as um, behaviour, educational attainment, attendance. We had kids at that school who were on the national news TV programmes, like GMTV, we called it at the time, and, and the newspaper and stuff talking about how bad the bullying was. And to me, looking back, I can see that school was never about education. It was about survival. And there was loads of things that was happening at that time that I didn't know and none of us knew. We didn't know that we were part of a lad culture. We didn't know about addiction. No one used terms like mental health. Yeah, young men weren't encouraged to express our feelings. Every time... You walked around the corner in my area, you know, it was it was danger. You could walk into a group of lads and you could get stabbed to death. That was you know, our reality. And then, especially in your teen years, it became very tribal, very territorial. Then all the substances crept in. Um, for me, I was already addicted to hardcore porn from a very young age. There was a family member had tapes and it was anything illegal it was just normal porn but it was hardcore and i was 
think 10 years old the first time I discovered it. So that's quite an extreme thing for you know, a young child to discover. And from a very early age, I learned coping mechanisms and I learned <clears throat> unhealthy habits for dealing with how I felt. I was getting an escape from real life through you know, porn and then alcohol. And the alcohol was you get because one of the lads in my school, his, his dad had a corner shop and the lad would bring in half bottles of whiskey and half bottles of vodka. And a lot of us had like paper rounds or we got bits of pocket money and we'd club our money together and we'd buy it. So by the time I'm 14, you know, I don't know who my biological father is. There's a lot of violence in my area. I came from a very modest working class family. I've gone through the education system and I've been failed by it. And I'm already an addict and I have absolutely no clue about addiction. And you know, by the time I was 14, 15, I was already suicidal. I was already, I was, you know, I remember wondering when I was 15, how you make a noose? How do you make a noose to kill yourself? And I have those kind of extreme thoughts at such a young age. I mean, I had some real serious trauma and some real serious issues going on that I could never have understood. And so, like most of my pals, left school, barely 16, no qualifications, no chance at a career. And I was never going to own a house or a car or anything like that. I was completely dysfunctional, had abandonment issues and didn't know how to build proper relationships up with women or anything like that. And there was other things that happened, you know, my my mum, I say, I call him my dad, he's obviously my stepdad, but he raised me, so my mum and my dad moved us out of Ladywell to an area called Ealyburn, which is arguably a probably more middle-class area. But I was still deeply traumatised by the time they moved us. And that was just before I turned 14, we'd done that move, and that's when we first got a PC, you know, a, a home computer. Mm-hmm. It was the first time we had access to the internet and I used the chat rooms and what I call it, an older man. I won't be too graphic about that stuff, but, you know, when I was talking to this person, they were, they were he was grooming me and I didn't know he was grooming me at the time. What I thought I had was a friend and a confidant and like my mum and my uncles and aunties, were, were, they're all from Salford, they're all from Manchester. So I grew up thinking that this Northern English accent was always a safe place. And this man I was talking to was Northern English. He was from the North and we'd speak on the phone. And I felt safe, I felt safe with him. And again, I have to reiterate, it was when the internet was brand new. So there was no webcams at the beginning. There was no like, it's not like Facebook. There wasn't a status, there wasn't, you know, you don't put videos up. It was a basic chat room. you just seen the words. And you would each have like a cartoon avatar thing with your face. So I mean, we never got to know the real versions of each other. So I didn't know much about who this person was. But after a year of talking to him, you know, and, and confiding in him that I was suicidal and all this kind of stuff, you know, we met. Um, and I, I, like I say, I won't be graphic about what happened, but he took me to, he took me to the hotel. And they met me a couple of times in my life after that, um, between the ages of like 15 and 17. And it confused me for a long time. It, I think it made me dysfunctional in relationships. It made me confused about my sexual identity. And I never had, I would never have anything against someone, no matter what their identity was. But I had no idea what mine was. And I was trying to figure it out. It was also a time, like I say, where this was an era of a lad culture. So young men were just not encouraged to talk about our feelings and we just didn't do that. We only talk about our feelings when we're high on drugs, you know, and we started taking the uppers, the ickies and the cocaine and the speed. And then we'd be telling each other, oh, I love you, man, I love you, dude. And that would just come out with the substances. So to try and even get my head around this experience I'd gone through, and to confide it in someone. And I had no idea back then as well that I was looking for a father, you know what I mean? Like I had a stepdad, but, and I called him my dad because he helped raise me, but we never we never connected. There was 
no natural chemistry or love there. Mm. And I was aching for my biological father, you know, I wanted answers as to why he didn't want me. Yeah. And that was that was the real search. And that's what I think led me to talking to this older man online. And of course he took advantage of what was a very vulnerable, suicidal young boy. So these things, by the time they all happened, you know, I'm already fully involved in an addiction lifestyle. I've already left school with no qualifications. I've already grew up in an environment where a lot of us had an inferiority complex. None of us had big plans for the future. Everything was all about living for right now and not in a healthy way. It was a forever young type of attitude. And the, the drug use just escalated. And so did the violence. I got into a lot of violence with a lot of lads that lived in my area. I mean, it was not just me, it was all of us, all of the lads that grew up in that area and, and girls as well, but predominantly my issues were with other lads. And the violence just went worth, you know. Suddenly it went from people dumping each other to folk stabbing each other or killing each other. And people you went to school with dying, overdosing and dying or getting murdered or murdering someone else and ending up in prison. And it just got very, very real and very frightening. But again, you're at that young age where you're a lad, you're not supposed to talk about how you feel and you want to act hard and pretend and none of this bothers you and you're just deeper and deeper in that life. Other things started happening along the way. So my mum and dad had done my little brother who was six years younger than me. When I was 17, my well, your brother was diagnosed with a very rare cancer. Um, so rare that it was, there was no treatment for it in the UK. There was no treatment for it anywhere. Nothing that was, you know, tested and, and proven. And for four years, you know, my family tried everything and the NHS tried everything and basically said there was nothing left to do. Went to Russia for treatment. And during that four years, I was age 17 when he was diagnosed and I was 21 when he passed away. You know, he passed away of this rare cancer. And he was 10 when he was diagnosed and 14 when he passed away. My addiction just went to crazy levels. Me and a friend of mine moved in together. My friend was also an addict. And again, we didn't know we were addicts at the time. Uh, and our drink, drink use and drug use was every day. And this is all tied up at the same time as the violence and me carrying around the trauma from what happened with the older man and then my brother dying. It was just all happening at the same time. And I hit some of my worst rock bottoms during my brother's cancer battle. One example I give is that me and a friend, <clears throat> excuse me, me and a friend raised £3,000 towards my brother's cancer treatment. Now, this was before, like, go fund me pages or that you know this was still before the internet and social media took off mm. and it was still quite young then so it was a case of a brown paper bag and an a4 sponsor sheet and so when my brother was in russia getting treatment for his illness the money me and my friend had raised it was sitting in a cupboard in my mom and dad's house and i broke in and stole some of that money some of the money i helped raise i stole it to try and feed my habit that was probably one of the first times I realised how serious the drug use was. And I got caught doing that, thankfully. And then I ended up paying back what I was going out of it. But it didn't take away the guilt and the shame that I felt inside for the act. Paying it back was one thing. And that was only because I got caught, if I'm honest. If I didn't get caught, I possibly would have ended up spending all of it. But I couldn't understand why I kept doing that. You know, and I never really had a chance to recover from anything. My brother passed away, and when he passed away, I was 21. I was living with my friend, <clears throat> and gone so bad that we weren't paying bills anymore. We were in tens, of thousands of pounds worth of debt. We had dealers after us. I had all these all these relationships in my past that I just failed constantly because I didn't know how to be in a romantic or an emotional relationship with someone. I didn't know how to treat a woman. And I was self-harming, you know, cutting my arms with knives, thinking about ways to kill myself, but not having the, the guts to see it through. Um, maybe that's the wrong way to say, but I just didn't 
know how to see it through, even though I felt that way. And <clears throat> I think one of the first turning points was I was almost murdered one night by a group of lads that I had issues with. And not long after that night, they ended up in a scat with some other young lads and did murder someone. And then the guy that tried to murder me ended up in prison for a couple of homicides for killing a taller lad. And the way I looked at it at the time was none of us were bad people, not even the person that done the murder. It was a case of we were all a part of this chaotic, horrendous lifestyle. Mm-hmm. We all grew up in streets where you know, we didn't have much and we were, I don't know, we were raised at a time when I think lads were taught to tear each other down and to see each other as threat, you know, rather than build each other up. I mean, one example I give is when I was at school, me and my best friend got given braces by the NHS to fix our teeth. Hold on. Um, Rather than wear the braces, we broke them. We broke them so that our mums wouldn't make us wear them. And the reason we broke them is because you'd get beat up in school from wearing a brace on your teeth. And so we would rather not fix our teeth and not get a doing than to wear the brace and get beat up. So it's just a kind of warped way we were all made to believe was normal. It was a social norm that we all tore each other down and it's one thing doing that in school, but you know, last four or ten years later, and it's becoming like murder and stuff like that. So, I mean, I ended up going to Canada for a while. I'd made a friend, this guy who's an older guy, and this was a friend that was <clears throat> a healthy relationship. He was someone I looked up to again, probably because he was an older man, but he wasn't someone who was exploiting me. He was someone that was looking out for me. He moved to Canada. I'd met him here in Scotland. He moved to Canada and gave me a chance to go and stay with him on a six-month non-working visa. And you know, before I went to Canada, you know, after that night, we almost got murdered. I got that big a fright. I ended up going to my GP, and my GP guided me to West Lothian Drug and Alcohol Service, so a service in West Lothian, and they. Asked me if <clears throat> they asked me if I might be an addict. It was the first time someone had ever asked me that, and I went to recovery meetings, I went to fellowship meetings, and started to get a little idea about recovery and addiction. But before I could really get a hold of that recovery, I had this chance to go to Canada with my friend. And when I went to Canada, I had this idea in my head that I was going to go there and find myself. I thought I was going to find myself in the mountains surrounded by wildlife and that I would just be spiritually awoken over there. What I didn't realize was that all the problems I had in the inside me, they were in here and they were in here and, you know, I was an addict. I didn't realize at that time that I was an addict. Um, I knew that I had a problem by this point, but I didn't fully, fully grasp that I was an addict who needed to be abstinent from drug use. So when I got to Canada, rather than finding myself, what I found was drug dealers and more of the same chaos, violence. Within the first two days, you know, I went to Vancouver um, and, my, you know, my friend was taking care of me. So my mum and dad had helped me save some money off and my friend was basically putting me up for free. But it was just all my chaos over there. Something did happen whilst I was over there. I went to uh, recovery meetings, fellowship meetings when I was over there. And that was giving me enough periods of clean time that I was able to start doing other things when I was there. And I volunteered in almost hostel. So I was staying between Vancouver and this other place called Kelowna, which is about a six hour drive from Vancouver. My friend had two different places, so going back to two areas. And when I was in Kelowna, that's when I started volunteering in this homeless hostel. And basically, it was a case of I was in the kitchen, preparing sandwiches and soup, eating coffee, and giving it to homeless people. 
And when I say homeless, I don't just mean people that were, you know, staying at their friends because they had nowhere to go. I mean, these were people that were on the street homeless. And I had been homeless at different points in my journey. And when they came in and I was serving them tea, coffee, soup, food, I was identifying with them. And I was starting to get this other feeling that at the time I couldn't really articulate what the feeling was. But now I know that I was starting to get self-esteem and self-worth. And then um, the reason I was getting that is because I was doing something selfless for someone else. I wasn't volunteering there to get any reward. It was purely a selfless act. I was just giving up some of my free time. And I wasn't like buying the food, you know, the food was already there. I was just preparing it and handing it out. But even that alone, you know, they were they were so grateful for that. And I could see how broken they were. And I identified with how broken that they were. That was, I think, the first time in my life I'd ever done anything that was purely about something for someone else that wasn't about what rewards they got. So from that moment, you know, it planted a wee seed in my head that I need to do things in my life that involves me helping our people. And if I can do that, you know, I might have a chance in this life. Um, I had to come back to Scotland because ultimately my addiction was still powerful for me when I was over there. I had managed to live a bit of a double life. I was either using and end up in people's basements or, you know, in Canada there's loads of basements, so he would end up waking up and change basements. Um, or I would be in recovery meetings or in the homeless hostel, but eventually the substance abuse would, would win. I came back to Scotland and I started a college course at West Lothian College, basic level entry course in health and social care. I chose that course because I wanted to help our people the same time, I went back to the recovery meetings. Now, I didn't get clean overnight. I would get three weeks clean and then I'd relapse. I'd get a month clean and then I'd relapse. So it was back and forward. When I came back to Scotland, you know, I don't think the drug you use, you know, I don't think addiction is about the drug you use, right? I think addiction has nothing to do with that drug per se, but my drug of choice was cocaine. And when I came back to Scotland, Pure was going about and pure cocaine. And it was like when I was when I was clean, I'd never tried this pure. And so my mind was saying to me, You need to try it once, you need to just try it. And at the same time, I'm going through college and I'm doing recovery meetings, and I'm starting to get a bit well. But I just couldn't ignore the urge to to try this pure cocaine. And uh I did try it and it took me an hour, year and a half before I got any more clean time again because it, it just gripped me, same as before. I managed again to live a bit of a double life. I was still doing college, I was still doing recovery meetings. And then I had a son, one of my classmates from college. And when she was pregnant, you know, we moved in together, we thought, that was the right thing to do. Again, I still had no clue how to treat women or be in a relationship, but I thought, well, we'll move in and, and that'll be, be the best thing. But it wasn't when my when my son was born, I spiralled. I spiralled to one of my worst rock bottoms. And I now know, look, looking back, why that was. I knew it's because, you know, I, I know it was because I didn't know how to love someone enough that I could put them before me. I didn't know how to love myself, so being able to be a father was, it felt like the scariest thing. Ironically, you know, I grew up hearing stories about my biological father. When I was born, he went and got wasted and never came back, and I always said I would never do that. And then when my son was born, I did do that. I'd done the same thing. And so anyway, after he was born, I went on a three-day binge, and I was completely you know, suicidal. At some stage during his early months, first few months, I ended up, you know, I mean, his mum completely split up and I ended up completely homeless. And then I was on a mattress, living on a mattress in someone's house on, on the living room floor. And the only possessions I had left were in a cardboard box. And ultimately I was back on another binge and I decided to kill myself and went to a bridge 
and lady well when I grew up. I had this romantic idea that I would end my life where it all began. And you know, a police officer saved my life that night. And it wasn't just that he stopped me from jumping. It was he treated me with dignity and compassion, treated me like a human being, didn't treat me like an addict or a worthless waste of space. And that's how I felt during all my using. I felt worthless. I felt hopeless. I felt powerless. I felt like I wasn't worthy of love. I felt like I had no future, no identity. I was fractured. Every time I'd done something horrendous to try and keep my drug habit going, it just made me feel even more of a scumbag. And then ironically, I just wanted to use more drugs on top of that to feel better. So that night, when the police officer saved my life and treated me like I mattered, this gave me a little bit of self-worth back, you know. I think that was the beginning of the end of my full-time drug use. It wasn't the last time I used, but it certainly was a life-changing moment. And I've had a few of those, you know, in Canada and that homeless hostel, that was a big moment. My son being born was a big moment, but that night in the bridge was a really big moment. I went back to college, finished my HMC, and I got a place in uni. And um, you know, nobody in my family that went to, to uni before, nobody in my street or I went uh, high school, I went to uni, uni, to my knowledge, and where that came from, it just wasn't something you spoke about. You didn't ever talk about going to uni. It was just not expected. Like I said, left school at 16 with no qualifications, just thinking I was stupid. The idea that I managed to get through college and I was successful at that, and not just that I got through it, I actually started something and finished it. As an addict, I never ever began a thing and finished it. Mm. Began a thing, and you're lucky if I even got one step of the way through it because I, I never had the tools to complete anything. So to complete college again and to be successful at it gave me the feeling that maybe my life can be different. I also started volunteering as I was finished college for victim support. And I was supporting victims and witnesses of time during criminal trials and, and high court, sheriff and jury, summary trials. And I was learning all about the criminal justice system but on, on the right side of the law. And I was supporting people and again, gave me that good feeling inside that I was doing something selfless to help someone else. And then I went to uni. And in my mind, I thought to myself, I'm going to just try uni as long as I can until I fail. I just thought that at some point I'm bound to fail because I thought uni was all about eggheads. You had to have, like, biggest brains, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out not to be the case. It turned out that for me to be successful, you need just required hard work and perseverance and determination. And any time I had a bad experience, like I didn't do as well or get, get a great grade, it was just about picking myself back up and going again. And I was doing that and I got to year three. I was about halfway through it. And in year three, that's when your grades start counting in uni because in year one and two, you just need to pass. But in year three and four, you need to get a certain percentage. I was halfway through it. And my life was just building back up. I was I was nine months clean from substances. I had met um, a woman that I loved at my own place that I was taken care of. And my son was two and a half. So everything was going really well. You know, I was doing recovery. I was doing everything right. So there was nothing bad going to happen because of my own behaviour. But then life... You know, we, we say in recovery of life on nice terms. We um, got this devastating news that my, my son had leukemia. He was two and a half, when we found out, and it was acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And after having gone through cancer with my little brother, I just couldn't believe it. None of us can believe it that this was happening again. And we were back in Edinburgh, sick kids, because when my brother was ill, we spent a lot of time there. And when my son was ill, we ended up back there. But it came down to two things then. It was like either crumble or a fight for my son. And so I fought for my son and I was lucky I was in recovery at the time and I had a lot of support around me. And then I had to decide what I was going to do about uni. Because I was, there was no way. I'd missed six weeks it when he was first diagnosed. I felt when you can, after six weeks of missing classes, you fall behind really quickly. But I spoke to my lecturers and my family and everybody and you know they were like, don't quit, keep on. I decided to keep on. 
thankfully, thank God for the NHS. They, you know, they cured my son. He had the most treatable, curable type of child cancer. Um, a good prognosis. And he recovered. And I managed to finish uni. And I finished with a 2-1, which is a B. I was buzzing with that B. And I got it in criminology and sociology. And the reason those subjects mattered a lot to me was obviously because of the life I had lived. You know, I wanted to understand why society was how it was. And I learned a lot through education and through my recovery scene that being an addict and having mental health issues and even criminal behaviour doesn't actually mean that you're morally inferior. There are reasons why people end up in these lifestyles. So I, you know, got my degree and I had a baby daughter as well in about this time. And then I got a job working for a good organisation, supporting people with bloodborne viruses, so like <clears throat> HIV and hepatitis C. And the reason that mattered so much to me was because I knew a lot of people from my using lifestyle, from recovery, who had had those kind of illnesses before. And so I felt it was an important job to do. And it was great. I'd done it for nine months, done really well. For the first time in my life, I was earning money, earning good money. But something happened towards the end of that job. You know, I was two and a half years clean. I'd done the 12 step program. I had a degree. I was seeing myself as a professional. Um, you know, I had a partner. I had a, I had a house. I had my kids. I got arrogant. Um, my ego got in the way. Stopped doing recovery meetings. Started fantasizing about drinking and using drugs again. And I went out at New Year's Eve and drank and took cocaine. And it snapped my mental health in two. And yeah, it took me six months to recover from that, to get back to recovery meetings. I'm not saying you know, everyone's recovery needs to be abstinent-based or recovery meetings, but for me, that's, that's what I needed for me. And my pride and my ego stopped me from going back for ages. But eventually did go back. And I'm glad that I did because I was back in a place of being suicidal, you know, to... To have got myself two and a half years clean and to have had all these successes, external things and the good achievements and all that, and then lose it all on one night. And it wasn't just a clean time, it was what I'd done to my mental health, you know. I mean, just done to my mental health. And then the fact that I was using again, so I was hurting my family again, because my partner had never seen me in my using lifestyle. And she got to see a side of me that I hoped she'd never see, and my mum seeing me relapsing and just putting everybody through it all again. So I'm, I'm glad I got back to recovery. And when I did get back to recovery, I started getting therapy as well. I got another job in the criminal justice system. Again, supporting different types of victims in society, supporting male victims as well, which the, the job I was doing at the time was describing male victims as hidden victims because... A lot of the time, males don't come forward if they're abused or mistreated and they're not always taken seriously. So that was an important job. And during this time, I went through two other big losses in my life. I lost my grandmother. She was very poorly. spent her last few years in the nursing home, but she was like a second mum to me. But when I lost her, you know, this time I didn't, you know, I didn't go back to using I leaned on my recovery and I wrote her eulogy and I, I said the eulogy in the crematorium and honest to God, the minute I stepped off the, the crematorium um, the podium the minute I stepped off that I got this feeling, this overwhelming feeling like write a book, write a book, write a book it was like this message, you know, and I'm not trying to sound like airy fairy or nothing, it's just got this message inside that said, write a book. And then I went home that night and just started typing up what became chapter one, you know, not the whole thing, just a couple of paragraphs to start something off. Then a couple of weeks later, I found that my biological father had died. So again, two massive losses back to back, and I never got a chance to meet him as I always wanted to. I've died his whole life in addiction. It was a you know, cancer that killed him in the end, but... 
his whole life was an addict. And again, I decided, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let this loss destroy my life. So I stuck to him in recovery, and I got another job working in West Lobian as an advocacy worker for addiction. And I started a course in social work, and at the same time, I started writing this book. Then I got the book to a level where I thought, I'm going to see if, my, if anyone thinks this is decent. And I sent it to one of my pals from uni and I said to him, promise me, if this is shite, just tell me. And he read it and he messaged me and he's like, this is amazing, this book's great. And I was like, mate, don't, don't kid me on, man. Like, if it's, if it's rubbish, just tell me it's rubbish. And he's like, oh, no, seriously, he's like, people will read this. And so I started, I figured out, I didn't even know what I'd written. I'd written my story and I gave it 12 chapters because it was symbolic of the 12 steps. But I didn't know that it was called a memoir. I didn't know that in a raw form it was a manuscript. I just had this piece of writing that I'd written in a story type of way. And so I had to research what it was and then what do you do with it after that? And I realised you had to pitch it to agents and publishers and they all, you know, they all had their own way they wanted you to pitch it to them and you had to find out what genre it was, which was a memoir and all of that. And then so I started pitching the book or the manuscript to all these different agents and publishers and if truth be told, they all rejected it. Most of them were like, no, no, no. It's, you know, I didn't have social media. I wasn't a celebrity. These are the things I was getting told. You have no following. You're not a celebrity. No one's going to read your book about addiction because they don't know who you are. Someone said to me, you should try and blog. Someone else said, you glamorize drugs too much. Um, they just didn't get it at all. To me, the only way I could describe it is in recovery, we do what's called a share. You know, if you're familiar with the recovery scene, people, people yeah. do a share. Well, I had written down a share, and I just thought to myself, people will identify with us if they read it. Um, so I... I kept on and kept on, but then my mum lent me 400 quid to get a review and I sent it to this professional in the literary world to review it. And she just, in a very nice way, tore it apart, but she didn't do it in, in a harsh way. She didn't do it to be nasty. I think she just felt there was no chance for it. I didn't want to give me false hope. So for about nine months, I put the book to the side and didn't think about it again. I kept doing my job as an advocacy worker in addictions kept studying in my social work course. Um, and then it was my mum, of all people. My mum said to me, you need to pitch this. And for whatever reason, I just decided, you know, I'm going to give it one more try. I'm going to get one more try and try and pitch it out. And I started trying to pitch it. And then all of a sudden, a couple of publishers were interested in it. And I eventually ended up with a publisher called Gut Publishing, who are my publisher. And they're amazing. Brilliant, you know, they believed in it and they cared about it. And they, they, when they were talking to me about it, I could feel how personal they were about it. And it just felt right. And then I needed a front cover. And a friend of mine who I grew up with in the streets in Ladywell, you know, was starting to do art. He's a musician, but he was starting to draw sketches and do a bit of artwork. And I said, um, I was like, I need a front cover to visualize. And it was just so I could visualize something. And then he sent me in sketches, and the very first one he sent me is the actual front cover of the book. And when he, when he sent it to me, I says, mate, I said, this, this is it, man. This is, this is the And then from there, it's just kind of, you know, the book. I had to get social, I, I had no social media, so I had to start over again. I had to get Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that. Never used half of them. And then I let people know, I was like, this book's coming out. And the attention that it got and the interest it got was insane. It wasn't supposed to come out until February this year, but because it got so much attention and interest when we announced it, the publisher brought the date forward and we got the book ready for October. And so the book came out. And since then, it's kind of propelled me into an activist and campaigner type of role. Because obviously we've got this horrendous drug death crisis. We've got the worst record in Europe possibly the world for drug-related deaths and a mental health crisis, which I believe is hand-in-hand is hand with the addiction problem. So just as my book came out, the figures came out for the for last year. 
one of the most recent ones came out last year and it just ended up putting me into places like prisons and talking to colleges and talking to the public and talking to the media and all of a sudden it just went absolutely crazy and then the book went crazy and just went wild you know um, and I started using this little platform that I got to keep fighting on behalf of addicts, which I'm still doing to this very day. Um, finished my contract as an addictions advocacy worker. And I'm almost at the end of my social work master's degree. Something else massive that I've done that I probably skipped over was I finally went and reported to the police what happened to me all those years ago. And I got my closure on that a very important part of the healing and um, I would never ever tell other people what they should do or when they should do it I think it's a very personal individual thing but for me the timing was right it was it was time to face up to it and I got therapy and I reported it to the police as well finally got closure on that um, so I and that kind of brings us up to right now you know I've got three months left on my master's degree is finished. I'll be three years clean in June and I'm two chapters away from finishing my second book, which I'm already talking to our publishers about. And the second book looks at the lad culture of the 2000s and the drugs and the trance and, you know, dysfunctional relationships with women and violence and all of that. And I just want to analyse why we were like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at in my life. Wow. I can relate so much to your um to your story. Um I was actually born in Glasgow. Um I'm adopted, um so I was adopted in Yorkshire and I grew up not knowing my parents, my my, my real parents. So I when I was told on my eighth birthday that I was adopted, that fueled my um fear of rejection um and then that fueled the drug bit binges and the drink binges and it just fueled the bad behavior for years because of that um that resentment i had but you know the fact that i had two loving parents um that were bringing me up went out the window you, you know I, I'd, I'd been dropped you know people didn't want me so you know my mum didn't want me so naturally selfish you, you, that's 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 how i felt so you know i can understand uh, those feelings of um wanting to find something more um wanting that that that, that father figure yeah you know, i i searched for that as well search for that um positive male men mentor um as, as i said at school um but you know i i went through a, a, abuse uh, in you know in my younger days and into, into my late teens but um so so i can understand with that and how we deal with it by uh, sort of self-medicating uh, and self-sabotaging as well that's a, one, oh, yeah. one thing that i found that with everybody that i speak to on you know on this self-sabotage is just I, th I think it's just the biggest it's the biggest weapon in a in, in a negative weapon in, in in an addict's arsenal it's as, as soon as the the proverbial hits the fan it's that self-sabotage and it's that you, you know i'm gonna kill you, you know i think i'll kill myself uh, you, you, yeah. I've been sat there with a gun up against my throat and pulled the trigger and it's jammed. He, you know, I used to say I wasn't bothered about that and it's only when I actually did, um, albeit for four odd minutes, that I actually realised that I wanted life. Yeah. So, you know, I, it's kind of the same sort of journey. Um, you know, I was asked to supply poetry uh, for a a book about a, a box about the name of Paul Sykes, um, whom I used to um, uh, collect debts with. And then I was, um, you know, the same publisher said, well, do you want to write your own book? You know, and I, I, I've got a, 
I suppose some of my family would call that ouncy flouncy, but airy fairy way of, of writing is it's is quite a prose, prosaic way of writing. I've always written poetry, so that's how my book came about, and you know, it's through this um, that I started building my confidence. It's through this that I started campaigning. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I managed to find my real mum, and I lost her at, uh, at about four, four or five years ago. Um, you know, so, and I'm coming up to seven years. Um, clean. Yeah, man. Um, awesome. and it's it's been a total change you know the, the one thing you'll know is, is that it's it's a total change of who we were you know we, we are kind of reborn and and, and we're something new um i had the you, you know i had the desire to to use taken away from me um you know i don't know if that's to do with brain damage or god but you know, um, I I don't have the desire to use anymore, but um, I do have the desire to educate, which is why you know, which is why I contacted you through um, Paul Bogey. Um, you know, and um, yeah, I just I've I've really enjoyed your story. It's um, it's 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 really sat sort of level with me, and you know, I um, I've I've felt it. Um, and it's funny you should say about um porn really that was that was a big one for me it's a big one for me it's one that I have struggled with you know um it's that is a, a massive addiction for a lot of people um, I think as there's a I think there's like more shame attached to it as well for for some reason when people ask me what my first drug was, I would always say porn was the first drug because I picked that up before I ever picked up a substance. Yep. yep. And it's the same cycles. It's the same using it to self-serve or to take feelings away or to, you know, to escape from something, especially if it's stress-related, and then the guilt and shame afterwards. And that's all the same stuff. Yeah, that is guilt and shame. Like you, you, you've, you know, you've pinpointed it right there. You know that that it does cause a lot of guilt and shame. You know, I grew up in the seventies and eighties and nineties, so I, you know, um, I grew up in the same sort of culture, um, in a sort of hick um, town that was like a market town surrounded by pit towns. So, you know, there was that toxic um, masculinity, that toxic way of thinking, uh, and I, I carried that for for years. Um, and that guilt and shame um, that you associate with uh, drug use, with pornography, it all builds up. Yeah. You know, it, it, it might not be there. You, you know, you might get that, that, that soothing for however long, and then, you, you know, it, it, it'll just build up and build up and build up. And over years, that can really sort of drag you down, and it can really affect you. It affected the way that I had relationships. It affected the way that I treated people, treated women, um, and that it wasn't nice. That's, you know, so I, 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 you know, I want to thank you for bringing that up because that's not something that a lot of people would admit. And you, you know, it's um, it's one that I've, I've, you know, I've struggled with. It, so I've got to admit it because you know the twelve step program that you're talking about. I work on a daily basis, and it's about honesty. You know, step one is about honesty, open mindedness, open mindedness, and willingness. You know, you've got to be honest with other people, honest with yourself. You've got to be open minded to know that you can't do it on your own. That there's got to be some sort of higher power out there um, that, 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 that can take it away. Uh, and willingness to change, willingness to learn, um, and willingness to put in the work. Um, this program isn't an easy program. People think you can just go to meetings, uh, and you'll you'll find that level and it often never does you know i went to my first meeting at 14 years old um and i've, I've had you know i had 12 years clean and sober and then i ended up homeless and on crack so you know it, it's a deceptive disease is addiction it's a deceptive disease um and it it will patient it's a patient disease as well um, yeah i think when i had my my last relapse 
I just, I mean, I never, when I relapsed at two and a half years clean before that, I never thought I'd use again. But you know, I, I, I stopped doing the healthy things that I knew were good for me. I started believing my own hype in my head. Uh, and it was, that relapse was devastating because I never ever thought it would happen again. And it does. It does. You know, it, it, it's sneaky, it hides. Um, and if you're not careful, it will it will catch up to you because um, it will deceive you and it will it will convince you. And it's that. Just one look. Just have one look. Ah, oh, yeah. Just just one drink. Be alright. That'll that'll settle the nerves. But then, you know, it might be for that short period of time, and it'll just build up and build up and build up. And before you know it, you're going through through the rock bottom that you've been through before further than you've ever ever been because for me the m more i relapse the deeper i go into um, my own oblivion which is why my book's called a personal apocalypse um, because it is you know it was the end of my world um, and to use would be the end of my world i would lose everything in sobriety i've you know i'm remarried um, I've got kids, um, you know, I've got this, you know, my, my, my little shed in, in the garden. It might not mean much to other people, but it means a lot to me. Um, you know, yeah. I, I've, I've got people that listen to me on a, on a weekly basis. Um, you know, I've got people that, that read my books and that follow my career. Uh, and I could lose it all just like that. Just like that, you, you, you know, and it, it, it it doesn't have to be a, a massive slip. All it has to be is just one one little mistake, and that's it. It's all gone. So, you know, we have to be aware, and we have to keep working that program on a daily basis. Pe people don't realise that it's it's a it's a daily. Yeah, program. I've seen. Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen them people who that that took this so seriously and and they valued it so much and then they done what I'd done and, and got complacent and then went away and their whole life that everything they built up why just like that again man yeah it's so easy to lose everything you know I went to eight funerals in, in seven days at one point before I moved here um, it's it's hard it is so hard I've lost so many people to this damn disease um yes you know and I, I i lost myself for a long time um but i'm blessed to have grounders you know you know um a, a loving wife and a shitload of kids but you know it's um you, you know it's more than going to a meeting it's more than just working on the steps it's it's a whole new regime it's a whole it's, it's reprogramming it's you, you know those that, that, that say they can just stop like that it, it's just it's ridiculous um you know there's so many i've had so many people just um you know, uh, accuse me of living in my own drama and um, say, you know, it's just, you, you know, if you're going to lose everything, just stop. Um, people don't understand that, you know, we're not living in our own drama. We can't just stop. It is a disease. It is mental, physical and spiritual. Um, people just think it's it, it's it's a, a bit, an addiction is a, is, is a bit of a, um reliance on on substance and it isn't it's a life disease uh, and being a life disease it, it, it's, it takes a lifetime to work through and we are as only sober as we are when we get up so you know um i want to thank you for coming on and and, and sharing your um, thank you for having me sorry. um can you give us the name of the book so the book's called euphoric recall um, it's available in lots of different places from Amazon or Waterstones or um, 
gutspublishing.com. That's the publisher. You can get it on uh, paperback, ebook, audiobook. Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. Um, I'm just going to cut the fade in a second uh, and then we'll just have a quick wind down if that's all right. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so much. Cheers for tuning in, guys, as always. Um, thanks for all your comments. I'll go through them in a few minutes. Uh, and I shall see you next week with Malky Paul. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, we might have one in between as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I shall see you soon, guys. Um, catch you on the flip side.